Um, welcome to Pacifica. For some of you, welcome back for a third day, maybe, uh, of this long weekend. Um, for some of you, it might be your first day, first time. Um, so we welcome you um, as well. We're happy that you're here, and, and thanks for being here. Um, so we have a little bit of a new event uh, for us. Usually, our alumni panel is part of our Pacifica Experience Days, which was yesterday. Um, but we wanted, we wanted to give it its own special um, event. And the alumni perspective is so important to us. Um, and we really value their you know, opinions and, and, and everything they've gone through. So, um, so this is really special. And today, it's really focused on uh, what we call reimagining careers. Um, so we'll dive into that. Um, and we have about six presenters that you'll be hearing from. Um, but to get things started, um, I think we're going to have a few words from our president, Dr. Joe Cambray. Thanks, Alex. Well, welcome, and thank you for all for coming out on a Sunday morning like this. This is a, as Alex said, this is a new adventure, um, trying this. And it's part of a kind of new direction that we're thinking about. That's why I wanted to talk for just a moment. Um, it's sort of reimagining uh, student services as well uh, and going forward. We've, we have a robust student service program, but it hasn't had uh, enough of a career focus. Uh, and we're really thinking of this as a, in a holistic kind of way from the beginning of your application right through to your oh, moving into your alumni uh, status, that we're thinking about career and that it becomes career in depth, uh, the depth dimension of career. So it isn't just a career in this discipline or that discipline, but it's a kind of an approach to uh, reflection and thinking at a deeper level about what career is. Going back probably uh, to Jung's uh, notion of uh, vocation, he picked that up from the Latin, voca, the inner voice, following that kind of deeper sense of what is uh, the sort of purpose of my life, um, which can't be found just totally in some kind of external set of criteria that really has to be an, um, an encounter between what's going on deeply inside of you and your environment. It's in that intersection, that interacting interaction. So, and our graduates and our alumni really um, vibrantly carry that sense of career. Um, and so we want you to have a chance to hear from them what what they've been through, what that's like for them, and some other things that we're going to be doing at Pacifica in the next couple of years, we hope, is doing more research. We're looking to um, begin a research center in depth psychology. Uh, and the other thing would be that we're going to do a lot more international work. I'm in the middle right now of setting up a, a satellite campus in China, and there will be opportunities that we're going to do that piece in China, but there will be opportunities for students to do field work there or to do for faculty to do sabbaticals there. And if that works, we'll continue on with a globalization project. So just giving you a little bit of a flavor for where Pacifica is and where it's beginning to head at this point. And with that, I'd like to turn this over now to the to our panelists. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you so much, Joe. My name is Joya Jacobson, and I went through the master's program in counseling psychology, um, which was Pacifica's sort of originating program. Um, the first thing I want to do is just take a moment, it's all right, to get out from behind the podium and, and to see you lovely people. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes. Good morning. Um, so I'm Joya. It's spelled G-I-O-I-A, but it's pronounced Joy with an A at the end. It's Italian. Um, and I'm going to ask for your grace and compassion as I am a new mom or an old mom or a second time mom. And, and my little one is four months old. Um, so I have not slept a full night <laughs> in at least four months. <laughs> um, so I may be doing some, some note reading, which is one reason I wanted to make contact with you all directly. Um, and also to say that if I need to slip out at some point, um, it will be for baby. You'll hear him possibly 
possibly crying. So, um, yes, thank you for welcoming me and also baby Noah, though he's not visible or present. Um, so when I was first invited to speak at this event, I was initially excited because I have immense gratitude for Pacifica, for the program I went through and for the opportunities that it's afforded me. Um, and that was quickly followed by a sense of anxiety um, as I thought, who am I <laughs> to offer any wisdom about career or individuation? How very big of me. Um, and, <laughs> and, and that was compounded um, sort of by, by being the, the first presenter, um, which was an, a necessary accommodation um, for my son. Um, but, but also, yes, leaves me in a space where I am sort of breaking ground on this new phenomenon of, of bringing the alumni to come and speak about their wisdom. Um, so I very humbly say that um, I'm, I'm here to give you my story, and I hope that uh, there are kernels in there that, that speak to you or that uh, resonate. But, but certainly, I, I do not uh, suppose to be any sort of an expert on how one uh, comes to career effectively. I can only tell you of my own meandering path. Um, so my work now is as a marriage and family therapist. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm also adjunct faculty at Pacifica in the counseling program. I'm a research associate there, and I offer administrative support in the counseling program as associate to the director of clinical training. So those are my many hats in addition to mom, which is also a full-time job. Um, the quote from James Hillman, which appears several times in, in the Pacifica literature and catalogs, um, spoke to me as, as the best description I've come across so far in terms of my own lived experience of, of where I arrived uh, in terms of career. And he says, the call may have been more like gentle pushings in the stream in which you drifted unknowingly to a particular spot on the bank. Looking back, you sensed that fate had a hand in it. So that's wisdom from James Hellman. Um, so I had decided to become a therapist when I was in the eighth grade. And my exit survey from middle school confirms as much. <laughs> um, there were only two professional skills I, pro I possessed, um, which I thought might be marketable. And one was writing, and the other was counseling. And even at that young age, I, I knew or understood that if I was going to be a writer, I was going to be an English teacher. Um, and I did not wish to be an English teacher. Um, my mother was a teacher, and I said, no, I will not be my mother. Thank you, Freud. Um, and she actually taught at the college level, so I particularly wanted to avoid that because I saw the copious amounts of grading that she did after hours. I think she had calculated it once and like, 33 cents an hour if I, if I you know, take all of this time into account that I'm grading all of these papers. It was constant, right? She always had this stack next to her, and this is how I remember my, my childhood. Um, so as early as, as my um, eighth grade career, I had decided I was going to be a therapist. Um, and then as soon as my undergraduate work in psychology at the Claremont Colleges, I was trying to find ways to escape from this decision. Um, so I decided to double major in English and psychology, leave the door open. Um, when I found out that after a BA in psychology, you need a master's and 3,000 hours of training in order to become a therapist. I filled out the drop form for that major, <laughs> and I was bringing it to the office um, to, to put it in the box, and I was going to skip my class that afternoon and go on to, to English that evening and, and move right ahead. And I crossed paths with my professor for the afternoon class, and he waved, and I thought, oh dear, now I can't skip. Um, so it was in that class um, that I met Dr. Terrell Hellander, um, who was presenting on her I Think I Can mental health curriculum that she was delivering as a prevention curriculum uh, in low-income public schools. And I said, this, you know, I need to do this. And at the end of her presentation, she said, and, and if you stay next year, you can do a lab with me, and we'll go out in the field and we'll present this curriculum. And I said, okay, I have to stay. Great, I'm in it for one more year. 
comes time to apply to master's programs and I'm looking at the course offerings and I'm saying, these are the same courses I just took in psychology. All of the MA programs that I was seeing, the course descriptions looked just the same. I said, I can't do it again. I've just done it. I have no interest. So I applied to two sets of graduate schools, MFAs uh, in creative writing and also MA in psychology programs. Thankfully, I stumbled across a pamphlet for Pacifica, and it was such a profound sense of relief that the courses looked different, that they were offering something deeper, uh, that there was a literary sensibility and a, set, a sense of, of personal narrative woven into those courses. Um, so I said, yes, here, this is the place that I can go. Um, and I'd like to say that was the end of, of sort of my attempt to escape from the field. It was not. Um, <laughs> as, I, as I sat in class and began the traineeship requirement, which is a huge part of our program, uh, to go out into the field and work with people, I realized that my personal constitution doesn't allow me to see 35 clients in a week, um, which, which is what um, sort of an, an agency setting often demands as full-time caseload, um, or 35 hours. Um, and then I was sitting in class, and Luann Walner, who I work closely under now, um, said that two years after leaving Pacifica, you were eligible to apply to be a teaching assistant. And that same familiar spark that kept me in this field so many times, again, sort of lit up. And I realized that all of these years, I thought I had been running away from psychology, but really I had been running towards teaching. <laughs> And there was that huge kind of boulder, unconscious boulder in the way, because I had, I had stamped my foot as a 13-year-old and said, no, I will not teach, um, that I couldn't even see as Psyche was, was leading me, leading me, A, to Pacifica, and then in the program um, to become a teacher, uh, to become an instructor. So that is that is what I do now. I, I work in our, our research series. Um, so I get to read lots of wonderful writing. I get to teach about research and writing, um, which I adore. Um, and I also, um, I know we've got limited time here as I'm watching the clock. Um, but I wanted to bring in uh, my own thesis. Um, which I wrote on seeds and self-actualization, which in hindsight uh, was a very fitting explanation of my own career journey. Um, so while I am not, or at least hope I am not actualized or at the zenith of my potential, um, I hypothesized in my research that as as humans, as people, our greatest hang up in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and getting to the top might be our own forgetting that we, as with everything else in nature, are always, and most often without conscious effort on our parts, uh, being pushed in the direction of actualizing or being pushed towards our fullest potential. So I hypothesized that perhaps we could build our trust in this process if we observed the trees, the animals, the other organisms all around us involved in the same process and remembered that we are the same. We are of the same matter, right? We are moved by that same uh, self-actualizing potential that any seed would be. Um, somehow it's easy to imagine that these entities will automatically become their intended selves, but it's harder to believe that if our environmental needs are met, uh, that we would grow into the humans that we were born with the potential to become. Um, so I'll leave you with closing thoughts and, and reflections from that thesis work. I said, psychological theories that include self-actualizing tendencies tend to look at people and see their grand potential. A gardener is able to look at seeds and see the potential of a plant. The process which living things are all engaged in right at this moment, whether we're taking in oxygen and converting it to carbon dioxide or the reverse, is all explained by the same verb, to grow. 
And the conjugation of this verb is a rough encapsulation of what it means to be a living entity that is constantly involved in a transformative process. I grow, you grow, he or she grows, we grow, you all grow, they grow. This is true in the simple past, present continuous, and future progressive. However, what I found most exciting in this research was the ability to look in the mirror or at the person standing next to me or out of my kitchen window and apply one statement in particular to all of the life I saw. I will leave you with this phrase and along with it, I hope, the power to see yourself, other people, and the world around you through a lens that is both inspiring and forgiving. It is simple, it is elaborate, it is happening, we are growing. So I thank you for your time and I wish you all the best in becoming. Thank you very much, Joya. Um, and just to explain a few, a few things, we are going to have a Q&A at the very end. Um, so if you could hold on to your questions. Until then, with all the panelists at the very end, um, you'll have a chance to, to ask any questions. Our next presenter earned a PhD from the clinical psychology program and is a registered psychological assistant in California and currently, as, and currently is at uh, La Vie Counseling Center in Los Angeles. He was also a postdoctoral fellow at Occidental College. Um, please welcome William Jones. Do I even need a microphone? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a lot passionate, so uh, forgive me if I stray. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I'm a, I'm a bit of a storyteller as well, so I thought it might be a great idea to just kind of tell you what got me here and, and how I got to Occidental, how I got to the V, um, how everything kind of worked. And, and, and just thinking of synchronicity when you talk about self-actualization, the title of my dissertation is The Process of Self-Actualization Among Historic African-American Leaders. So it's just a synchronicity. And then we were talking about self-actualization right before we started. Just, I love it. So yes, my name is William. And uh, let, me, let me start at the beginning. I'm originally from Chicago, and uh, I was a, uh, a pretty uh, successful, if you will, child actor. Uh, I was on a TV show called California Dreams uh, for about five years, and I was an emancipated minor, which meant that uh, I lived in Chicago, and NBC Productions flew me to Los Angeles to film the show. And I had a tutor in between seasons and um, kind of lived the, you know, the 15 minutes of, of fame. Uh, you know, uh, father wasn't around. Uh, mom was in Chicago but moved out to help me stay on this show and uh, try to give me some kind of grounding as I met all my new Hollywood friends and, and just try to make sense of the circus that was um, Hollywood from a 16-year-old pers perspective. So I did that show for a while, then I did another show called USA High, then I did another show called Living Single, did some movies, uh, and then I started a theater company. Um, and I, I kept uh, feeling um, empty inside. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I couldn't figure out uh, why that, that shining kind of light that was in me was dim and, and dimming and just kept dimming and I couldn't, couldn't fix it. Uh, I, th I thought maybe I need to be re-inspired. So. I went back and took some acting classes, and that didn't help. Um, I said, well, maybe I need to get around some mentors. And so I went out there and, and tried to connect with some, some uh, people whose work I admired, and that wasn't working. I said, what is going on here? So I eventually I found this, uh, this church, and, um, which was its own process. Um, went through about seven of them, because I thought um, you know, a lot of them, there was like a, it was kind of like a show. And, said, you know, this, I don't want to, I'm trying to move away from shows. I want to find something authentic, something real. But I eventually found this one place, and I, and I wanted to just serve. I wanted to be a, a steward. I wanted to give back in some way. And so they, they had me become what's called a lay counselor. And essentially, I was just there to help people as they came in and just kind of talk and see where they're at and, you know, maybe pray with them or something like that. And I started to notice that they were sending me, meaning the elders, they were sending me people who were, this one person in particular, particular was uh, actively suicidal, uh, and that kind of scared me. Uh, and there were other people who were uh, recovering from uh, some really significant things. There were other people who were homeless. There were 
uh, people who were uh, in some kind of domestic violence situations. And I kept thinking, I don't know how to really help you. I, I can listen to you. I can try to offer you advice from a very adolescent kind of perspective, but I don't know how to really help you. And I thought to myself, I got to do something about this. Let me, let me go and take a psychology class and, and see if I could learn something to actually help uh, the people who are being sent to me. So I went to a community college. Uh, this was in my, my early 20s, and I loved it. I absolutely loved this psychology class. I said, well, let me, let me take another class. I, I really like this. I took another class, and I just, you know, it's like that fire that I was uh, missing started to wake back up. I became like that guy in class who was just annoying and <laughs> asking a lot of questions and doing all the homework and but thinking, aren't you excited too? Did you hear what he said? And this is great. What is this? This I love this. So I said, I want to get a degree in this. Uh, so, but I didn't just want to get a degree anywhere. I wanted to get a degree uh, in psychology where there was a curiosity or a, an integration of you know, faith. So uh, I found a, a school. I'm not sure if I should say the schools here or not, if that matters. Ah, okay. But, so I, uh, I, I found a school named Biola, uh, and they had a nice integration of faith and psychology. I thought, this is fantastic. They appreciate psychology, and they appreciate a faith perspective. So after that, uh, this fire continued to just grow and grow and grow. And I said, well, I want to I wanna get my master's now. I want to get a master's in this, maybe be an MFT. And so I, I went to Pepperdine. And uh, again, another integration there with, that I was looking for. And I enjoyed the MFT process. But uh, you know, after finding out that uh, 3,000 hours as an MFT and 3,000 hours as a psychologist don't mix, so unless I was superhuman and didn't have kids and didn't have to work or anything like that, maybe I could do both, but otherwise I had to choose. And then I thought, well, what, 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 am, I, what am I feeling pushed toward? What am I, what am I being called toward, uh, to? Uh, speaking of uh, Hillman, especially when I read the acorn theory, it just uh, really resonated with me as far as you know, following that nudging, that push, that awakening that was happening. So at Pepperdine, uh, I got introduced to some psychodynamic concepts, but it wasn't enough. Um, and and I, I thought to myself, what, 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 is, what is Freudian? What is, what is this psychoanalytic thinking? What is, what is depth? What is, what is any of this? And where can I go to get training, accredited training? So I thought about a couple of institutes to maybe get a doctorate there. But uh, at least the institutes that I found, they weren't accredited. So that could be problematic um, down the road. So, uh, I was a, uh, what do you call it, teaching assistant for one of the professors at Pepperdine. And we were doing a private practice visit at his house. And he and his wife had a very successful private practice. He was an MFT as well. And uh, he also had a doctorate. And he, he was showing me around his library, because uh, I had to get there early to help him set up and, and uh, you know, prepare the room for the students to come. And he was showing me his library, and I was talking about the different books he had, and I was just excited. And I noticed his degree on the wall, and it was from Pacifica. And I had never heard of Pacifica. And I said, what is Pacifica? What is, where, what did you, you know, what's, and he, well, Pacifica. And he just started to uh, light up, and, and I recognized that light. Uh, and he spoke about it very passionately, and it just piqued my curiosity. And I was listening, listening, listening. And that night, I went online. Google Pacifica. There was an introduction event, kind of like this, or maybe something similar to you, what you did last night. Uh, last night, and I came, and I just couldn't believe uh, the the panel that was there. So that's why it's a little surreal for me to be here now. Uh, just the way they were talking about depth, and and uh, I kept thinking, what is depth? And it, it sounds like something I'm so interested in. It sounds like it's psychodynamic, maybe psychoanalytic, but there's something else. And who's Jung? Who is this Jung guy? Everybody's talking about Jung. I want to learn about this Jung. I didn't hear about Jung in my master's or my, my bachelor's program. So I applied here, and I applied to one other program, uh, got into both, and it was a clear decision. This is where I should be. I um, can't believe I'm actually chewing gum. I, I never normally do that. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a little out of sorts, and I got my kids, too, back in the, the room, and maybe that's, uh, I'll blame them, but. Um, <laughs> so, uh, just, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up, because I can talk a lot, I, I tell a lot of stories. So, I came here, a, a, an amazing experience, 
Um, I'm a very ambitious uh, person, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, a bit of a risk taker. And I remember right at the beginning of deciding whether to come here or go to the other program that uh, there was a question about, well, will it, will it hinder you in any way to go through the PhD program here? Um, I said, well, I don't think so. Well, you know, what are your long-term goals? Do you, do you want to work at an institution? Do you want to be a researcher? Do you want to, uh, you know, be in a private practice? What is it that you want to do? I said, all of it. <laughs> I don't want to do all of that. Okay, um, so this is a conversation I had with my wife, this conversation I had with some colleagues, and I just knew I had to be here. And so, as a pre-doc, there were a couple of sites that I wanted to get into that um, they didn't really have students from non-APA accredited programs. Uh, I didn't care. I said I'd like to, I want to be a part of that program. So I applied, and um, there's this, I don't know if I should say the name. Oh, sure. No? no? Okay. So there's a program called uh, uh, at Hillsides, and it's a uh, psych testing internship or externship. And there's only three people they choose. It's highly competitive. It's, it's normally all APA people, and I got in there. And then we opened it up for you all, right? And then after that, yeah, right? Yay. Talk about just, just you know, psyche and everything kind of working um, in our favor. I think the depth percepti uh, perspective is, is, is needed, and it seems to, um, seems to make us stand out in interviews. Uh, and in conversations, even with some of my colleagues, they, they, they keep wondering, you know, where did you get your training? And what, what is, um, how, how would you think about this from a depth perspective and so forth? But anyway, so I went to Hillsides for my, uh, my pre-doc, and then I heard about a place called Rose City Center. And Rose City Center was typically a place for postdocs. Uh, they're very psychoanalytic in their orientation, very eclectic in that analytic orientation, and, uh, but they don't typically take uh, pre-docs, but I wanted to go there. So a uh, lot of stories about how I kept knocking on that door and got in there, but I got in there. Um, and it was their first pre-doc in their postdoc program. So I'm there for three and a half years. And uh, one of our group supervisors, we had different rotating group supervisors, came in and said, you know, at Occidental College, they're looking for uh, postdoc fellows. Um, you know, who's postdoc here? I wasn't a postdoc yet. But I thought, Occidental College, that's where Barack Obama went. I want to be a part of that. <laughs> I'd like to interview. <laughs> OK, but, you know, you're not a postdoc yet. Maybe you should wait a while. Sure, OK. I went and uh, contacted the director of the counseling program and wrote a statement of interest and all that. And lo and behold, uh, uh, they, they wanted to hire me, but they <laughs> only had funding for postdoc. I bless you. So they rearranged the position uh, in order to hire me as a postdoc. And I, was, I am uh, uh, the first postdoc in their counseling center from a place like Pacifica. So I uh, did that for a year and decided, I think I want to do private practice. I like this. Um, I don't want to just do this. There's a lot of uh, oxy is a very intense uh, environment, a lot of future leaders there, a lot of activism. Uh, I said, you know, I want to, I need something a little calm for me right now, so I want to do some, uh, some private practice. And then I found out about Levy, uh, and Levy has the same kind of integration of faith and psychology that I started with at, Bi at Biola, something very similar. So, uh, you know, did what I needed to do and, and got in there as well. So. My point is that when you're doing this kind of work and when you're, I think, um, alive and, and, and putting the, what, the theory into practice, what does it mean to actualize? What does it mean to actually walk in the, your potential, whatever that is for you? What does it mean to trust that the door will open uh, despite what the criteria says? You know, this is what we're looking for. Let's see. I think you're looking for me. Uh, you just you didn't you didn't write it. You didn't you didn't write it. So I'm gonna help you figure that out. So. Anyway, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, William. Um, so we'll move right along. Um, 
And then after our next presenter, we'll have a short break and then ask for our three other presenters to, to come on up. So um, our next presenter earned a PhD from the Depth Psychology Program and has been project coordinator and volunteer manager at the Opus Archive and Research Center. She is co-chair of the Eco Psychology Network of Southern California and is also a certified ecotherapist. Uh, please welcome Gabrielle Milanic. So she's gonna, she's gonna, are you gonna sit? You're I'm gonna, gonna sit. Okay. I'm gonna be a little bit more casual because I just want to be able to engage with you. Um, so good morning. Um, I, when I was first approached about speaking today on this particular topic, I thought, oh, individuation, but I'm a Hillmanian. I'm not a Jungian. <laughs> so where does that leave me? So I started to think about, okay, let's kind of shift the frame a little bit, and what does this mean for me? Well, I'm still in the process, so I can't give you any kind of wisdom of my, you know, enlightenment or how I have individuated, you know, through Pacifica, but what I can do is simply tell you a story and kind of draw you in from where you are sitting right now um, to, you know, your present, your questions are, should I go here, is this the right place for me, to looking forward into the years of when you're writing your dissertation or when you're doing your, your oral defense. So, if you come to Pacifica, there are two questions that really circulate throughout your time, and um, we like to, to give more um, energy and credence to the second one, which is, so what's your dissertation about? What are you writing your dissertation? Um, however, there's another question that preempts that, and you're all in it right now, and that is the question of how did you come to Pacifica? And there is a mythology and a mythos that is built up around people's approach and coming and hearing about Pacifica and how they, how they come here. And almost invariably, that approach um, inhabits and includes some form of synchronicity or something magical happens um, where you feel that, that deep resonance to place and you simply know is the place. Um, that you need to be. So just to kind of give you a, a, a grounding in that, an example of my own experience, um, I, I too am from Chicago, yay. <laughs> and I did my undergrad work in uh, English literature and art history, did a double major. Um, and I was lucky enough to go to a very, very small liberal arts college, a private, private college, where we could, for all intents and purposes, write our own curriculum. So I focused all of my work on mythology and the myth ritual theory. So when I finished that, um, I thought I wanted to go forward into myth, um, but something just wasn't, it was, that wasn't fitting somehow. And I decided to take a gap year. <laughs> and what I did was I walked the Camino de Santiago twice, in 2001 and 2002. And now, I'm sure probably you've all heard of this. Um, it's a pilgrimage route through France and Spain, although it has different routes throughout Western Europe. And obviously, while you're walking, you know, the, these big, momentous, um, psychical events happen that you really can only process, you know, after, after the fact. Um, however, in the middle of my pilgrimage, I was on what's called the Meseta, which is translated into, it really means the inner plateau. <laughs> so right here we see something psychological is coming. Um, my entire focus of the pilgrimage, though, was to find Eros. Where is Eros in my life? Where, where's the passion? Where is that luminosity? And the Meseta is a very dry, barren, um, kind of landscape. It's very, very hot. There aren't a lot of trees. So it's very solar. It's very solar oriented. Um, and while I was walking, I got into this very heady, very academic um, notion of what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> and 
at that time, I had applied and been accepted into the University of Lancaster's uh, PhD program in Rel religious studies. So I was about to uproot my life in the States, move to the UK, and do this very academic, very British um, perspective of study. And it just wasn't fitting. It wasn't working. And on the very last day in the Meseta, or on the Meseta rather, before you descend and then approach another mountainscape into the province of Galicia, which is very lush, very green, very moist, and their folklore and their mythology is very um, similar to the Celtic traditions. So I was very excited about getting into this landscape. I'm very Irish Scottish, as you can tell. So. The last night before you know, I'm to make this this descent and ascent. Um, I met a woman, uh, an American, with her husband, who turned out to be the first female to write an anthropological dissertation on the Camino. Um, it had been studied and researched before, but always written about um, from the male perspective. So she was the first, the first woman. And we were sitting having dinner. We were two Americans, you know, uh, meeting in the middle of Spain. And she's like, "So, what are you interested in?" So I was telling her about Lancaster and mythology and and you know different spiritual practices, traditions, that kind of thing. And she said, oh, you need to go to Pacifica. <laughs> and I said, what's a Pacifica? <laughs> I then went to, and you'll, this is a kind of a throwback term, but I went to the cyber cafe in, in this little tiny town and looked up Pacifica. Well, okay. <laughs> so uh, now this is a couple of websites ago from what you see now, but there was Lambert. Every, all of the photography was Lambert. Okay, now I'm sure on Friday when you pulled in, you went seriously. <laughs> I'm gonna study, go to graduate school here. Um, yes, yes. So I saw these these images and said, yes, that's that's the place. Um, total knowing, you know, certitude. Um, however, life is life, and um, I applied to the myth department for four years in a row. And right before the coming to the the interview and all of that, I would pull my application. And four years. <laughs> And finally, I was like, I sunk into this depression because, okay, I'm not gonna go to Pacifica, you know, the money, the travel, the this, the that. And finally, I, I called at the time, she was kind of the mother of Pacifica, her name, was, uh, her name is Diane Huerta. I said, Diane, I, I said, it's not myth, it's depth. I have to go depth, I have to go deep. And on the surface, that was about the program that I came out of offered field work. And I am an introvert. Um, uh, but field work felt to me like that's a challenge, that's a risk. And it scared the bejesus out of me. Because <laughs> uh, I don't want to go into the world. I want to just stay in my nice little mythological cubicle and, and write and, you know, do some art and all of that, you know. So I applied to the depth department anyway. And my, my when you write the, your personal statement, you know, I led with the quote from Joseph Campbell which um, he said, the function of the artist is the re-mythologization of the environment and the world. I thought, well, okay, that's, if that's not a clarion call, I don't know what is. Um, so I followed that and arrived at Pacifica. Uh, my, now, I don't know if they still do this, but they had an, an initiation kind of for first years, a little bit of a hazing in a, in a depth way <laughs> and in a very kind and, you know, loving way. Um, they threw balls at us. <laughs> so we were in a circle and having these balls and you had to, you had to catch them and throw them back and, and all these balls were in the air and, and somehow we survived that without, nobody got too injured with that. And then they gave us gifts. And the gift that, that I chose from the basket was a scrolled up piece of parchment wrapped in, in raffia and, and it just looked old and it looked medieval and, it, and, and I thought, oh, there's wisdom here. 
and I unrolled it, and written out was a quote from James Hillman, soul is not given, it's made. And that, uh, I even just got chills just thinking about it now, just that, that memory of encountering that phrase, and that intuitive knowing that this coming to this place was going to inextricably change my life on all on all levels, um, academically, intellectually, of course, psychologically, emotionally, creatively. Um, so that whole story, you know, I, I kind of break what I'm saying here and, and ask you to, as you're going through this process, consider, keep in mind how you you're creating the story, you're writing the story right now, and how how is that going to inform, you know, your work here? Because then we arc over the classes, three years, boom, you're done, because that's how fast it goes. <laughs> Even though you're writing papers and, and all of that, it still goes so quickly. And at the end, then you're in dissertation development, and what are you going to write? Here is your Pacifica opus. And while I was writing my dissertation, um, I had become very much um, enamored with eco-psychology that became my end all and be all. So I knew I was gonna write uh, some sort of dissertation on, on that. And I, through a series of um, evolutions, um, I came to write a work looking at the animism inherent within place, place as itself animated, and how do we respond and how do we communicate with that. And my uh, perspective was that that was through gesture. So through my dissertation research, I started taking pictures. I became this photographer that I had always wanted to be and never really knew that I was, and an image itself of these animated, what I called creatures, creatura, of, of place, um, became for me co-researchers, co-participants in, in writing this work. And while I was doing that, I was also working at Opus Archives. Uh, now, if you haven't had a, any kind of introduction to that, I, I highly recommend stepping in, you know, your first week, because I'm just assuming you're all going to come here. So <laughs> that just, we, we got that out of the way. <laughs> Stop into the archives, because it is, um, well, I'll, I'll quote Hellman again. When Hellman walked into the library, which is right over there, that holds Campbell's works, as well as Maria Gambudas, he walked in and he took a deep breath and he said, ah, the heart of the place. So right there is the heart. These are the, 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 the imagination, the soul, the spirit of these people who, who really form the scaffold and the foundation of, of, this, of this school. And the, the archives informed so much of my, um, of my approach to my, own, to my own research that the photography was not just you know, taking image after image or documentation, it was creating portraiture. It was creating these records, these living records of something so ephemeral that was going to change, that was not going to be a part of, of places that we, that we visit. And if I can just tell you one little one little thing that when when you come here, you're going to encounter these people that you've read and you've heard about and who have written these amazing works. I mean, we've got two people sitting here right now, Joe Cambray and Craig Chalquist, who've both written these seminal pieces and you get to hobnob with these with these people and they're all over the place and it, they are as much in the process as you are. And that really struck home uh, with me because when I was working at Opus, I found myself, I had to curate an exhibit up at um, Monterey and it was, a Campbell, it was a Campbell exhibit. So I had to recreate his writing studio that he shared with his wife, Jean, up in New York. And that was a very specific place. So we had to get it, we had to get it right. Those, and that, that, the curated ma materials were his books, his papers, the little trinkets, and you can actually go into the archives now and see this set up, see the desk. So here I am, I have to rent a van from U-Haul, and I am, I find myself in this surreal moment, stepping back, of I'm actually loading 
Joseph Campbell's writing desk where he wrote The Power of Myth. The, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank now. All of these texts, the, the lectures at Sarah Lawrence, this surface is where he's written them. And here I am loading it into a van. <laughs> and I stood back for a moment and thought, this is what Pacifica brings. It brings you into the, the world mythology. You become a living character and, and storyteller in that, in that mythology. And to my mind, there's no greater gift than that a school can give you. So thank you. Thank you.